What is going on, guys? Welcome back to a new edition, a new week of MedGeek's videos. Today, we got a great case by Rachel. Rachel, what do we got? We have abdominal pain. So this is a stud. This is a case from my general surgery uh, practice. We have a 22-year-old male with no significant past medical history, no significant surgical history, just coming to the ER with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting for the past two days. He said the pain started a day prior. He had just a dull, diffuse ache throughout his abdomen, something he thought he could handle, maybe like a musculoskeletal thing. Yesterday, however, after dinner, the pain became sharp, more localized over the right quadrants, both upper and lower, and had a bout of non-bloody, non-bilious emesis. Between that one episode and coming to the ER, he had another two bouts of emesis. Again, non-bilious, non-bloody. He's just here because the pain is significantly worse than anything he's experienced thus far. In our ER, he says it's at 7 out of 10 throughout this entire um, episode. He's had no fevers, no chills, no change in bowel function, so no diarrhea, no constipation, no systemic symptoms, just this pain, three episodes of emesis, and just continued nausea. And vomiting, too. Yeah. Right. The- okay. So, any past medical history? No. No and surgical history. Surgical no history? Nope. Nothing. Um, social, he is sexually active with just one partner, drinks about three glasses of beer and wine a week, no illicit drug use. Okay. Um, interesting. So, yeah. you know, when I was in my general surgery rotation, we had this 85-year-old surgeon who would give us weekly, you know, case studies, basically. Mm. Retired, but comes back just to teach the students. Students, which is isn't that nice? Pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie, um, but you know he had this thing where he said the most common thing is what it is. So if you think what it is, it is it, right? So in this case, if it's a 22 year old male, right, with right sided pain, acutely, mm-hmm. nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite. You're thinking, you know, it's probably going to be appendicitis. Likely. Right? Like, is that is that on top of your differential? Yeah, that's number one way up there. Definitely thinking it's going to be appendicitis. But you want to keep a broad scope. Kind of like your back pain case from mm-hmm. last week. Mm-hmm. Had you thought it was just back pain, back pain, missed it, you would have missed the renal cell carcinoma. True. Right? So, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's going to be a duck. Mm-hmm. This looks like, walks like, sounds like appendicitis. Yeah. But you want to rule out anything else. So because he has pain up in the upper quadrant, I'm thinking maybe it's something with a gallbladder pathology. Yeah. You know, he said he had a fatty meal prior. He had, I think, a burger and fries. He's been having fatty meals recently. Okay. Like, went back to school. Plausible. Yeah. Plausible. Not highly likely, but could be. We're also thinking maybe constipation. Likely should be over on the left side. Right. Right. Could be gas pain. Could be a, the uh, hepatic or splenic flexures, right? Yeah, it would exactly. be sharp pain and intermittent, mm-hmm. right? So, did you have a physical so exam? Good. Yeah, so vital signs, it was afebrile, rock solid, stable, blood pressure, heart rate. Like a normal 22-year-old. Normal 22-year-old, you know, mildly gets a little tachycardic from pain, just comes right back down. Okay. Um, his abdominal exam... So, before you start that, in, okay. in terms of abdominal exams, I know you probably do a lot of these abdominal exams, given that you work in gen surge, probably every day. Yeah, so, 67. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what is your systematic approach on going about the abdominal exam? What do you start with, and how do you go about that, if you can just give us a... A quick one, yeah. yeah. Um, just kind of exactly how Bates teaches you. You always want to inspect the abdomen... Last thing you want to do is have the ER come call you and say, you know, this person has diffuse abdominal pain. You walk down there, miss a knife sticking out of the abdomen because it's under a sheet. Mm-hmm. Should not ever happen, but inspect the abdomen. Um, you also you want to look for, like, scars or anything. Yeah. You know, that could give you a clue that maybe it's adhesions that he's had. You're giving you a clue to small bowel mm-hmm. obstructions, maybe. Maybe hernias that could be causing the pain, right? Yeah. Definitely, if you have any sort of erythema, induration, you might be missing a soft tissue infection. Right. Um, always, always want to take a look. Mm-hmm. Some patients will say, oh, no, I've never had surgery before, but I had four C-sections. Right. And you wouldn't have caught the C-sections because 
not everybody thinks of it as a surgery. Right. Yet, if you examine the abdomen, you'll see that scar and be able to mm-hmm. put two and two together. Yep. Um, you always want to take a listen to the vowels. You want to go in a counterclockwise or clockwise um, fashion, just either or. Don't jump around. Sure. Um, you're looking for hypoactive or hyperactive vowel sounds. Hypoactive, um, kind of leading you more towards it's an obstruction or an ileus. Mm-hmm. And hyperactive leading you more towards just very overactive bowels and just maybe a lot of gas trying to pass through. Okay. Yeah. Um, you always want to palpate. It's going to help you localize what in what is. quadrant, where, what right. anatomical structures underlie that area. Also, um, it probably, you know, it probably matters too whether it's, you know, deep palpation or, or you know, more superficial mm-hmm. palpation, whether it's, you know, a visceral organ or a superficial organ. Kind of give you gives you a clue to what's going on in that sense too. Yeah, and most benign exams, most benign pathologies, a little touch like this mm-hmm. shouldn't make the patient jump out of bed. Right. If it right. is, you should be a little more alarmed. That's entire ischemia, maybe pain out of proportion. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, and then if the patient's more distended, you now want to rule out: is this air? Is this simple fluid? Is this blood? Mm-hmm. Um, a simple thing you can do is percuss, listen for something hollow or dull. Yep. Now, are you, is this free air floating in the abdomen to also perforate? And now the belly is just full of air and you have to go immediately to the OR. Right. Is this hemoperitoneum, does this patient have like a splenic laceration and you're just bleeding into their abdomen? Or is this your alcoholic cirrhosis patient for 50 odd years is just full of ascites? Right. So you physically examine yeah. this patient? So he had a relatively benign exam, nothing to make me worry right away. He was soft. Mildly distended, just a vi- minor bit. Um, his tender to palpation, deep palpation over the right quadrants, again, both upper and lower. No rebound, no guarding, negative McBurney's, negative Murphy's sign. So, not a specific, not a specific physical exam. exam. No. It didn't really you know, help you specify any, any of your differentials, knock out anything, right? Yeah, just verified more of his story. Okay. That yes, my pain's right here. And I can reproduce that. So where do you go from here? Imaging. And, and labs. So ultrasound first? Um, so labs first. Labs first. Labs first, right. obviously. Most of his labs are relatively benign. had a white count mm-hmm. up to 15, 16. Okay. So you think there's something happening. Right. Not exactly sure Infection what it is. Infection or inflammation. Yeah. Something is happening. Um, so that's when we move on to imaging. Mm-hmm. Standard of care actually now, and I mentioned ultrasound, is a CAT scan. Okay. I know we learn a lot in school and sometimes a lot on clinical rotations is do an ultrasound. It's cheap, it's fast, and mostly anyone can do it. Yeah, just right? about. But I think the negative part is also that anyone can anyone do it. Can so you, you get the, like the subjectiveness into whether it is appendicitis or not because not everyone has the same kind of experience um, uh, to doing it and reading it. So you get the subjectivity. Yeah. And, I mean, is that where the CT scan comes in? or? And the appendix is difficult to visualize on an ultrasound, even in a very experienced hand. You don't always see it. So right. you can't rule right. in or out if mm-hmm. you can't see. Yep. You know? um, so standard of care is a CAT scan. Mm-hmm. If patients are can't get the contrast, can't be put into radiation for a CAT scan, such as like pregnant women, young children then, yeah, you can rely on an ultrasound or you can rely on an MRI. Right, right. Um, so we do CAT scans. This young male had a CAT scan, showed inflammation around the appendix, so appendicitis, but he also had inflammation up ascending into the cecum. Okay. Well, before you get to that point, you know, I, I know that not everybody has the, the usual finger-like structure coming off of the cecum. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also have it retroperitoneal, and you can also have it, you know, kind of longitudinal along the lower, um, abdomen, yeah. the lower abdomen. So you can even have it curved up. So I'm assuming your physical exam and your symptoms also change depending on where that structure is. Yeah. Right. So on ultrasound, I'm assuming if you're even obese, you can't get you know yeah. the right exam. So the CT tell you exactly what kind of structure of this uh, the the appendix is and mm-hmm. and where to go from there yeah so like you said if your patient is obese 
you're not going to be able to get a great ultrasound. Right. There's just too much tissue right. in the way. Um, again, like I said, if it's retroperitoneal, it's going to be more difficult to visualize. If it's swinging up to the right upper quadrant, again, more difficult to visualize. If it's over, if it's swinging over to the left and you keep looking in the right, right. you're not going to be able to find it. A uh, CAT scan is great because it gives you a full abdomen. So you can look, take a look at the stomach and follow the bowel all the way through and see where the appendix is, exactly what position it's in. Is there anything else going on around mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. How safe is it for us to be able to go in and take out this appendix? This young man didn't have any surgeries, could have been a relatively simple laparoscopic case, sure. aside from sequel inflammation. Sure. But if you do have a patient with a high amount of inflammation right. or great amount of surgeries, you have so many adhesions to get through. It's just really important to get that whole image so that way you can speak to your patients, let them know, you know, this may not be a simple right. three hole right, right. go in and go out. So, so if I get, if I'm getting this right, mm-hmm. you're getting the CT scan, not only for the diagnostic purposes, which is important for this guy, cause we can't differentiate within his physical exam. So we yeah. need to get the CT of, so we'll see, you know, the right upper quadrant and the right lower quadrant to kind of distinguish what's exactly going on. Mm-hmm. But it's also for, uh, you know, for the procedure, for yeah. planning the procedure, what's going to happen and if you're going to do it laparoscopic- laparoscopically or an open procedure. Right? Yeah, and it's really great to also be able to walk your patient through it. That's true. It's a great mechanism for, like you said, diagnostic planning, yeah. therapeutic, just surgical planning. And the patient's more comfortable with you too now, now that he can visualize yeah. or she can visualize it. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, this young man, like we said, he has the sequel inflammation with the appendicitis. In the, right. So that means it's not a relatively simple appendicitis anymore. The inflammation ascending to the cecum, if if we were to go in at this very moment to take out his appendix, mm-hmm. he's at risk for losing a bit of his small of his large bowel. You don't want that. You don't know. Mostly because recent studies actually show with appendicitis. You can treat non-operatively with just IV antibiotics, go home with PO antibiotics, and come back for an interval appendectomy. Like an elective procedure. Like an elective procedure. Just kind of like, I walk in, I want a nose job. I walk in, I want my appendix out. I did not know this. Well, you would have to have a history of a bout of appendicitis. You can't just walk in and say, please remove. Obviously, yes. I get that. Um, So... For this patient, because his cecum was also involved, the, the plan was to go with the IV antibiotics, Correct. have that inflammation kind of calm down, and then do an elective procedure mm-hmm. on him. So for him, we chose ceftriaxone and aflagel. Okay. Watch his white count go down, trend a questionable possible fever curve. Right. Provided his white count starts to stabilize, he's been afebrile, his pain's resolving. He then... He was discharged? He, yeah, he did. He went home. He went home on Bantin and aflagel. 10 to 14 day supply. Mm-hmm. And once he's done with that, a week later he would follow up with the outpatient uh, general surgeon. See how he's doing. See how he's doing. Yeah. See if he wants to come in for an elective appendectomy. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the uncomplicated and the complicated mm-hmm. appendicitis. Uh, I'm assuming complicated appendicitis includes a, whether it's ruptured or perforated. Whether you have an abscess, what what other would what other examples would it be for uh, complicated appendicitis? Um, a pregnant woman. Pregnancy. So you want to look at your yeah. demographics. Yeah. Is this a pregnant woman? Is this somebody with cancer neutropenic? Okay. Um, definitely, like you said, perforation. Yeah. Is this perforated patient unstable or stable? Um, definitely the abscess. Definitely a phlegmon. So each of these patients is treated differently. Okay. So basically, you know, to simplify a little bit. If it's complicated, then we'll go for emergent surgery. Yes and no. So if it's a perforated, unstable patient, mm-hmm. then yes, you have to go to the operating room, take out the appendix, wash out the abdomen. Yep. You're at risk for having free-floating stool mm-hmm. if you have a perforation. If you have a stable perforated patient, it could be a walled-off perforation. If So that can be treated with IV antibiotics. Okay. If you have an abscess or a phlegmon, Again, it can be treated with IV antibiotics. If interventional radiology has a window and they can go in and put a drain in mm-hmm. and aspirate back and leave a bulb, leave a drain, they can just drain the entire abscess, the entire phlegmon. We can treat with IV antibiotics, let all of that cool down, and then follow up outpatient, both with general surgery for this possible appendectomy, 
and instrumental radiology just to make sure the drain is working, get it, another CAT scan, make sure the abscess is gone, and for the drain removal. So complicated. They basically need like an acute um, intervention. Yeah, whether right? it be antibiotics, whether it be the IR drain, whether or it be the, the OR. Surgery, right. And if it's uncomplicated, um, what do you do? Do we just send them home with some antibiotics and then have them follow up? Cu- follow up? It, so a lot of places will just offer to the patient. Listen, very uncomplicated appendicitis. You have the choice. We can take you to the operating room, do a simple appendectomy, can go home within 24 hours. That's pretty cool. Or a lot of patients are afraid of surgery. Right. If you're not in the medical field, it's scary. Right. You know, you're going to be under anesthesia, you're not be able to remember anything, someone's going to cut into you. Yeah. Um, you're given the option of IV antibiotics, let's watch that white count go down. And then go home on PM antibiotics, and we can talk about surgery later. So I've also read that you know they don't require surgery until another occurrence. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Yeah, patients are given the option. So if you are treated adequately with your IV antibiotics and PO antibiotics, patients can go up to a year without a reoccurrence. Wow. Oh, cool. So Is what that... happened? What happened to this guy? He went home. He went with home. PO antibiotics, and then followed up outpatient. Outpatient. I'm assuming you didn't. Did you see him? I haven't seen. Him. Okay. I haven't seen him since. So hopefully he's doing well. Hopefully he's doing well. Hopefully he comes back, gets his appendix out. Okay. Cool case. I like yeah. it. Thanks. Hope he... I hope you got... Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I was <laughs> going to say, I hope, he... I hope he did well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this case. Um, please leave any comments, concerns, questions. If any of you have a different idea of how to work it up or you would have worked him up differently in your emergency room, in your family practice office, anywhere, yeah. I'd love to hear it. I think it's a great learning opportunity for both us and any other comment readers. Yeah, agreed. Um, again, you know, thanks so much for uh, giving us your time, your energy. Hopefully, you learned something. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> everything. It was great. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see you guys next week. Um, hopefully, you enjoyed it, and uh, we look yeah. forward to hearing from you. Yeah, exactly. All right. See you guys. Bye.